Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Rio Hondo High School's Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resource Forum. Today, we have some very special guests with you from our community today. They're going to be sharing their knowledge, their expertise, and their time with us today. So we want to give them a big round of applause once they come up and join us to the front. Before we begin, we do want to remind you all that we are live streaming these events. So if you are watching, please give us a comment. We'll shout you out. Make sure that we recognize that you're watching. Feel free to submit any questions to us. On behalf of the Workforce Solutions Cameron team, we thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure working with Rio Hondo High School. I'd like to mention a few people that played some really important parts before we begin. I'm gonna ask a couple of people to say a few words and then I'll introduce the rest of everyone. First up from Rio Hondo High School, we have Mr. R. Mr. R, thank you so much. First of all, for sharing your uh, Twitter followers with us and making sure that we have a lot of exposure for this event today. Uh, Mr. R, would you like to say a few words? Good morning, distinguished guests, students. Uh, again, once again, I'm Mr. R, the proud principal here at Rio Hondo High School. And we're very, very excited for this opportunity. So thank you, Cameron County Work Solutions. And you know, remember students, we're live, so make sure you ask some great questions. So again, welcome and thank you. Thank you again, Mr. R. And next up, a regional director of Workforce Solutions, Mr. Henry Castillo. Students, I uh, uh, want to thank uh, Rio Hondo High School, uh, Mr. R, uh, the, uh, the district. I uh, want to thank our staff for putting this together. We're very happy to bring this panel to you. Uh, hopefully you'll we'll learn some things about, uh, about this particular industry. I know it's a big industry in this particular part of our county, uh, but whether you wind up staying and working here or wind up working somewhere else and you're interested in this particular industry, uh, feel free to ask a lot of questions. I want to thank the panelists that are here. Uh, that are going to share their, their insight and their wisdom with you. And again, on behalf of uh, Workforce Solutions Cameron, uh, I'll, um, I'm, I'm, we're happy to be here, and I uh, hope you all have a good time. Thank you. All right, a few more people before we begin that I need to thank. Ms. Waters for lending us the library today. Thank you very much. Mr. Zuniga for helping us coordinate this event. He put a lot of hard work and collaborated with our team. So thank you, Mr. Zuniga. <laughs> and Mr. Pena as well for every millennial's basic need, Wi-Fi. And uh, also any audio issues that we had. Thank you so much. We could not have had this event today without you. <laughs> now I'm about to step away from the microphone and pass this over to two students that are helping us today. We have the FFA president and vice president joining us today as our moderators, which will be moderating the panel's questions. First, uh, president of FFA, Ms. Laura Gomez. <laughs> Laura plans to attend Texas A&M University at College Station. And Justin Trevino, vice president of FFA, he also uh, plans to attend Texas A&M in Kingsville. So let's give these two students a grand round of applause for them. Now let's welcome our panelists to the stage. Panelists, would you join us? First up, we have Mr. Oscar De, De Duce. We have Mr. Mesa Delgado. Mr. Omar Mancias. Mr. Jen Nani. And Ms. Diana Padilla. Mr. Oscar Zabuche, he is the owner and operator of Magic Valley Urban Farms. Oscar holds a degree in psychology from the University of Texas at Brownsville and a Master's of Science in Organizational Leadership from Our Lady of the Lake. Oscar started Magic Valley Urban Farms two years ago, and which he still considers in the baby stages. 
Oscar hopes he can grow this into a company that he can provide local organic produce, specifically microgreens, to our community. Next, we have Ms. Melissa Delgado. She is the owner and operator of Bonita Flats Farm and Vineyard in North Fresno, Texas. Melissa and her husband, Mark, established their 16-acre farm dedicated to organic practices, a vineyard comprised of 600 Blancois vines, and also constructed three greenhouses that grow year-round greens. Over the last 10 years, Mrs. Delgado has been very involved with community health programs and initiatives, and has also received several awards for her work and contributions to the community including the 2014 Healthy Champion winner awarded by the University of Texas at Public Health and Community, excuse me, Community Advisory Board for the success and impact of the organization's healthy cooking program, the Happy Kitchen, La Cocinada Lecter program, which she implemented during her time as the Executive Director for the Wellness, Brownsville Wellness Coalition. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for Mrs. Melissa Delgado. <laughs> Next up, we have Denasa Organics, and representing Denasa Organics today is Mr. Jed Murray. Denasa Organics recognized early on that there was a niche for quality produce grown the way Mother Nature intended, organically. Thus, Denasa Organics was born. From their humble beginnings as a quarter-acre artichoke farm, they've always been dedicated to bringing the best-tasting organic veggies to you and your family. Today, at nearly 200 acres of organic goodness, they continue their mission to transform agriculture in our community by fostering the relationships between local farmers and consumers in what, in a way that is environmentally and economically sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jed Murray. <laughs> Next, we have Ms. Diana Padilla. Ms. Padilla relocated from Indiana to Texas in 2004 with her husband, Saul, who together own Hope for S Small Garden Sustainability, a nonprofit organization, as well as Yahweh's all natural farming garden in Harlingen, Texas. Diana, who was a fine dining chef for over 10 years, purchased this wonderful farm with her husband, who has been a farmer his entire life. Their paradise farm has trees that are over 20 years old. Pecan, orange, grapefruit, and peach trees are some of the trees on their farm. A champion master gardener once owned this farm, and Saul and Diana have embraced this tradition. Mrs. Padilla teaches cooking and sustainability classes at their whole property, where people from the community are welcome to visit and enroll in free farming business classes to learn the essentials of owning and operating their organic farm. Mrs. Padilla has said her goal is to get more people involved with the organic production and to help them create small businesses. Please welcome Ms. Diana Padilla. <laughs> Lastly, we have Mr. Omar Mancias. Mr. Mancius is a graduate of Homer Hanna High School in Brownsville, Texas, as well as from Texas A&M University and College Station. After completing medical school from the University of Monterrey, Mr. Mancius relocated to Houston, Texas to work in a freestanding ER and excelled in research at both UT Houston McGovern Medical School and MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is currently in the application process to continue training as a physician with hopes to attend a family medical residency program here in the Valley. Mr. Mancias is now an independent health con consultant involved in several aspects of agriculture, food, and natural resources throughout Cameron County. Please welcome Mr. Omar Mancias. <laughs> and now I will hand it over to begin the panel section to our ambassadors.
question. Um, I grew up in uh, both, both sides of the border, my uncle and my uncle. Um, I really, my, my, my career has got nothing really, well, there is a lot to do with agriculture when it comes to like, you know, uh, building relationships and stuff like that when you're trying to sell and things like that. But when it comes to like actually growing, um, it's been mainly trial and error and um, just doing my own research on the side. And, and uh, how I said it, you know, in my, in my uh, short bio that it's, uh, it's really on the baby stages, but uh, it does take a lot of work and, and it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful type of work also. Um, I, so my aspirations is basically to, to continue to um, provide uh, healthy options to the community. Uh, we do live in a community that needs a lot of these resources and more of these resources. Um, and we need to, well, uh, it's basically for me to work hard on, on this fund. So I was in marketing at first, didn't like it, realized I was more of an operational person. 
I went to the owner and said, hey, can I have a chance to work in the operations? Now, mind you, we had close to 40 crews of 32 people per crew out there working in the fields. They said, sure, here's your knife, there's the bus, go. So for six months, I rode the bus out every morning, I harvested all day long, and then I came back in the evenings. I started working on teaching some of the foremen and supervisors. Now these supervisors, guys, are making seventy to $80,000 a year. They came from Mexico, they worked in car washes, and then from car washes, they got a job working in the fields. From there, they got produced, to, moved up to be a supervisor and, and, a, and a foreman, and they're making 70, 80, 700, and they're getting company vehicles and company phones. These guys are super intelligent, but what I was able to do is work with them, teach them how to use Excel at the time, this is 15, 20 years ago, how to make estimates, because we make a, an estimate every single week on how much we have to harvest, and how much we have to harvest goes to the sales guy, and the sales guy then goes to his customer, and we try to sell the product. So I did that for about 10 years, back and forth, um, in different levels of management. And then, um, you know, the company I worked for at the time would do about 500,000 boxes of, of product a week. You know, so they're doing close to, you know, uh, you know, a million dollars, a couple billion dollars uh, boxes of, of, of product all the time. Um, from there, they moved here to the Valley and I started opening operations in Guanajuato, Mexico. And I worked with farmers there to basically um, secure product, move it through the valley, and then to our, to our customers. Um, that was a time when the economy was bad, and so they laid off anything that wasn't quite number one for them, you know, their core business. And since this was a startup, they, they let me go. Um, and so I had to retool a little bit. Um, and that time, I met a buddy down in Brownsville, the Yorkies, and we started farming. And then I have another partner, uh, Mark Miller, in Los Trezos. And so now we went from a quarter acre product to uh, around 180 acres of certified organic. HEB is our number one customer. And um, last year, they were, we were fortunate enough, they asked us to do a commercial for them. So when you watch the commercials where this is my you know, HEB, we're actually the guys say, this is your organic department, HEB is, is us. Um, so that's kind of my background. Um, I've worked in Peru, I've worked in Mexico, um, in Mexico, I worked in Quetro, Guanajuato, Sinaloa, uh, Baja Sur, um, uh, Puebla, and Tamaulipas. So um, agriculture gives you the opportunity to, to travel the world. I was in Spain, in Madrid, and in Malaga last, last month uh, looking at avocados. So um, I'm going to bring a different perspective to the panel from the side that I've, I've worked all over the United States and the world. And agriculture gives you the opportunity, if you apply yourself to, to get out of wherever you are and, and see the world and, and, and experience other things. Good morning. I'm, I'm not as elaborate as uh, the panel. I come from Chicago. Uh, we moved here in 2004, mm -hmm. my husband and I, where I took a job for customs. And I fell in love with a piece of property, 15 acres. And I said, what am I going to do with 15 acres? I, it's a lot of land. We're paying a lot of taxes. So we decided to uh, farm it, and we decided we were going to farm it organic, and then we found out there wasn't a lot of information here in the valley for organic. So we had to do a lot of internet research, uh, trial and error research. Um, and because we're, we're one of those socially disadvantaged where everything is really expensive, we found a lot of programs that are out there from the USDA that supported us to grow and we grew from 15 acres that we purchased to now we own 75 acres. Um, we started the nonprofit in 2012 to help the community learn what we learned trial and error so people wouldn't lose so much money. I retired from customs in 2015 and agriculture became my new career. I have done real estate. I work as a restaurant owner. And food has always been in my history, um, from my parents to mine, and my husband was a farmer his whole life. So agriculture is something really close to my heart. And when I moved here in 2004, I saw the opportunity that wasn't being approached by the people here. You have land, you have water, you have opportunity, you have uh, uh, a high interest, a uh, high rate of unemployment, so you have opportunity for people to turn, you know, no job to some job. And so we at Hope, with our nonprofit, are trying to teach people sustainability. 
You don't need 100 acres to start. Maybe later on you're gonna have that 100 acres. But with a half an acre, you can make an income. It is very hard for you guys as young people to find the funding to do something really big immediately. But if you start in your backyard, in the neighbor's yard, in half an acre, doing the community supported agriculture, which is what we do at our farm, people prepay for their product. You can start accumulating the experience and the income to increase. That's if you don't want to go to school because not everybody's for school. Hopefully everybody in here will go to college. You're going to need it. You're going to need that background of engineering. You're going to need that science. You need the research. We need all of that. But we also need the people to create food at a lower level. So here I am. I uh, run Hope for Small Farm Sustainability. We teach people how to become sustainable how to sell their extras, how to make money to increase their business, and how to start from small to big. We are located in Harlingen. We are funded two years in a row for US, from USDA to help uh, students or adults become the new organic farmers. And uh, if you have any questions or, oh, or you wanna learn more, I have some cards after. You can uh, get my card and we'll talk some more. Yes, I was uh, raised here in the Valley, educated at Texas A&M, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biology, and uh, my aspiration was to go to medical school, become a doctor, and help and serve through that route. Um, when I graduated, I came back to the Valley, and I became involved with the Bronzeville Wellness Coalition through uh, Mrs. Delgado and I helped build some of these community gardens and I saw the impact it had at that level. I, at that same time, I was offered uh, employment in Houston, Texas, and since that was more part of my career path, I followed that. And I worked at an ER, and I worked at MD Anderson, I worked at UT uh, Health Science Center in research, and seeing the connections between nutrition and health <clears throat> how disadvantaged we really are. We really do not see the connection. Um, when I was there at MD Anderson, I saw the discrepancy with the freshness. There was everything was packaged and prepared for you already. There wasn't a fresh vegetable or or anything like that inside. Yes, sir. Um, and I was hitting a a wall with my career path. So I decided to reset, move back to the valley, get back involved with the agriculture aspect. I started juicing, called, called cold press juice. Where we take the fresh produce that our local farmers make, some of the uh, regional fruits and stuff from northern Mexico, and we squeeze it down to the pressure. It's very primitive, but it's dense nutrition. And the impact I saw right away you know, people's attitudes and they were just happier and because they weren't, weren't in any pain anymore. And I started making these connections. Wait a second. Um, chemotherapy, antibiotics or chemotherapy, I didn't really get that. They have you so involved in books when you're in school that you don't see past the pages, but you start making those connections. And then the father of medicine, Hippocrates says, let food be thy medicine. Okay, there's, there's something to that. So through the farmer's market, I became exposed to sales and direct uh, customer contact and out, and through that it grew. I joined a goat dairy farm here in the valley, and we milk goats and make cheese and make the products. So now I'm involved from the, the, the beginning, the sourcing of the food, to the distribution of the food, to getting it to the customer, to the person, to the patient. And uh, it's a challenge, but it's very worthwhile, and we'll all discuss more on, on, on that.
If it's kale and kale is 90 days, so then you have to stagger it. So we create a plan with our customers, we create a planning schedule, and that schedule then all of my partners have it. So during the spring, fall, everyone has that. We look at it and says, okay, this week we've got to plant this many acres. We've got to plant a quarter acre of cilantro, we've got to plant two acres of kale, an acre of, of beets, and we make that plan. So then what normally happens is something's broken in the morning. So how does your day start? What's broken? What are we gonna fix? What's out of what's out of fuel? Where's the fuel? And and, and that's that's common. So if you go about life and something breaks, like that's just how it is. I mean, nothing runs perfect. Something's always gonna break, and you can figure out how you're gonna handle it. So our morning start with what's broken, what do you need to fix? Okay, let's get this fixed. Let's go out the fields. You know, you've got to check the check the, the temperature of the soil. Um, it's too hot, you can't plant because the seed will burn up. So you look at those things early on, but you need to pre-irrigate. So you're making decisions on how to, to prepare the land for it. So every day is, is something different. Um, from my standpoint, I'm the one stuck with sales. Uh, so what I gotta do in the morning is I get up, call my customers early morning, make sure everything's okay on, the, on what they received the night before. Go look at the computer to see what orders they've put in, what they've changed. Once that's done, I contact um, my shipping department. Guys, we've changed the orders. We need to increase this or decrease this. Um, be prepared for that. Contact the farm, say, guys, we've increased this, decreased this, talk to crews, increase this production, decrease the production. And then I usually leave the house and I head to the packing shed where then I have to watch the quality. My partners are doing the exact same thing on the farm. They're giving the orders out and then they watch every truckload, every box come through. They go through every single one of them. And the point of that is, if you don't micro control it and watch it, you're gonna fail. So that's the biggest thing I think I can tell you on our day to day or our daily jobs are is watching and managing and looking at every single thing that goes on because if you don't pay attention to one thing, that's the one thing that's gonna be bad. You ship it to your customer and they reject it and they throw it away and I use lost fifteen thousand dollars on the load because you didn't watch what you're doing. So the key to everything is watching what you're watching and doing micro micromanaging.
package or prepare foods for distribution. Kind of like what Sam's Club does or HEB has the meal preps and the ready-made stuff for you or packaged stuff so that you can make your own uh, meals, for example. So lately it's been finding outlets to sell this stuff. Right now, things like cold pressed juice or goat cheese or goat milk, it's not the most popular thing in the world, or at least in our neck of the woods. We're used to the turnkey operational stuff, the fast foods, the little restaurants here and there that they already have the model set up. Uh, so we're in a way competing with that. While we do sell to some of these restaurants uh, or larger distributors, it's still uh, not enough to support what we're doing. So we are in the process of building our own retail store. I started one in Brownsville called Live Juice, and we were making juice there and selling to customers, but that has its own problems. When you're an owner and an operator, you're spread out very thin. So my recommendation is if you're gonna go into something like this, you need to be prepared. It's a lot of work. Every day is different. And there are no guarantees. Um, but it is a wonderful life. Every day, I get to make something. I get to contribute to something. I work with my hands. I use the skill set I have. For example, the medicine. I've become, uh, I've trained myself to become a vet. So I take care of the goats, check out their health, how they're doing, uh, watching them, delivering babies. It's, it's pretty interesting. Two things have changed um, is one food safety and the second is technology as an industry uh, we're not nobody's getting more sick or less sick we're not doing things worse or better than anything else but um, you can speak to this we're better at, at, at finding it from a science standpoint and so therefore we know there's more food safety concerns uh, there was something back uh, last last January and in, in November there was a big scare on uh, romaine uh, if you guys remember, they pulled all the romaine off the shelves. If you went to HEB or wherever you shop with your parents, you notice there wasn't any romaine at all. Um, either bagged salad romaine or whole head romaine. It was all pulled off um, in, in trying to you know protect the consumer so that no one gets sick. So food safety, no matter, it doesn't matter the scale you're in, but if you get into this, this is a, an area that's going to be growing. So if you say, I have a science event and I like agriculture, you know, down here in the valley, we, every company has somebody who's going to specialize in the food safety area, especially if you get into, well, it doesn't matter the size and scale, because you're still feeding somebody and somebody's still eating it. So you still have to be careful if you're doing it in your home, if you're doing it in your garden, if you're doing it in a larger scale, people consume it. So you have to be aware of what they're, what, what you're doing so that you protect their health. So place I've worked here in the past, we you know, take a guy who's, uh, I'm, I'm in charge of trucking, so I'm in charge of uh, trucking safety, therefore I'm now your food safety manager. If the guy doesn't have any experience, has the eight food science classes, which is nothing against him. He's homegrown, he's learning it. But if you say, I like science, and I want to be involved in agriculture, you, instead of saying, I'm going to be a farmer, I'm going to go take food science classes at the local university, and I'll become a specialist in food science. And then you know you've got a job in food safety. And food safety is going to be more and more demand every single day because we're tracing it better, we're watching it better. And as we as producers learn, Here's how I have to handle this product so I protect it. For example, in the field we harvest with knives, right? So we go out and cut the, the, the kale, use knife to cut it. Where did that knife come from? Who had it last? So I sit at home with the guys, guess what they do last night? Hey, you know what, I need a knife. Well, there's a knife, let's go cut the raw chicken with it. They cut the raw chicken with it, they put the knife down, they come to work next day, we're gonna, we're gonna cut some more, more kale. When was that knife last cleaned? You got raw chicken bacteria on it. Who's gonna get salmonella or listeria or whatever with it? So what we do is we put protocols in place. All the knives get collected in a day. They don't go home with anybody. Twice a day they get sanitized with a parasitic acid. The knives get dipped in the morning before they start. They work. 
Every time you use the restroom, they put it back in the dip so they can stay as clean. When you go to the restrooms, we monitor the, all the sinks and all the, all the soap. All those are outside the bathroom. Why? So when they get done using the restroom, we can watch and make sure they wash their hands properly before they go back to work. So food safety is one of the biggest changes that's happened and will continue to happen. The second is technology. Guys, with drones, GPS, with um, tractors, uh, planters, it doesn't matter what it is in the industry, they have robots now harvesting strawberries in California. So if you like science, you're gonna have a job in this industry because somebody's gonna learn how to program it, design it, drive it. So these things, we're not talking like, oh, it's a $5,000 piece of equipment. We're talking a $100,000 piece of equipment, $200,000 piece of equipment out there in the field, half a million dollars. So, so technology is, is ever changing and that's a great opportunity for you. You don't have to get your fingers dirty farming, but they're gonna need you out there to figure out how to make the equipment work. They're taking cooling programs and they say, how do I cool this product? They're moving from a shed to the field and each investment is, is half a million dollars as they're trying to figure out how to cool strawberries faster around the world. So don't be pigeonholed that it's, it's farming only here, which is great, you should come back. But there's opportunity in technology and food safety for you guys as well. I would like to point out some important key terms, such as not everyone needs to answer the question. The choice is up to you. And please keep remember to keep your answers crisp and concise. Thank you. You may continue with the question. Um, that was awesome, and I think Mr. Murray addressed it on a on a more global level. I I would like to address it more on a small community level. How you're getting affected. So we've had many migrant families coming to this area and then going north. And it was very, very, very hard labor. So they, you have a whole generation of children that were told, don't do it. Go to school, get your education. They were kind of pulled away from agriculture and, and it was looked at as something that you are not gonna do because it's too hard. So now we have to change that mindset and say you can, individually, you can do half an acre, an acre, and still go and sell. And we also have been bombarded by a lot of fast food. People don't know where the food is coming from. That's how come school gardens are so important. We have one of the highest per capita fast foods in the world. I mean, it is just every corner. You can buy a dollar taco. And so nobody knows where their food is coming from. How many people touch the tomato in your, your, your hamburger? The person who picked it, the person who packaged it, the person who, it goes on and on to the person who cut it and then put it into your, your, your hamburger. We have to start looking at food very, very differently. And um, it starts with you just learning how to grow something in your backyard, an herb, whatever. And, uh, and, and the opportunity that you all have in this area is that you can grow year round. You can grow in a greenhouse year round. You can grow in your backyard year round. And up north, you have restaurants up in New York that are begging for greens that are grown down in the south and will pay triple, quadruple, and even shipping just to get it into their restaurants because they have a very, very short season. So um, the opportunity is there, um, but the way that you view food is something and agriculture needs to change. Um, what I see is everyone expects now to be on some kind of medication. That medication is gonna take care of you diabetic hypertension something like everyone has a family member that's on it uh, our goal is to make that obsolete like why rely on the healthcare system like that when you all can do it yourself like we we're saying uh, the technology and the safety they go hand in hand but at a cost also in order to upscale and get that many products there's a lot of other unseen things that go into the food, go into maintaining that pasture, that crop, the animal's health, etc. that we eventually consume and we actually suffer from. Like we are just getting insight into wait, these toxins and whatnot are contributing to a lot of our, our problems. 
Um, but it's at the same time, it's amazing stuff like what Oscar does with the vertical guard and the indoor. He's taken a lot of the risk out of it, produces a very clean product, and he doesn't have to rely on or, or be dependent on the sun and the rain and whatnot. And he can have a consistent thing, and that's where the technology comes in and the, the safety hand in hand. Uh, I just think it's a very tough job. But it's worthwhile because this is our health. This is this is our every day, um, and we need to be more conscious of it. I think the only change that I see is that I hear a lot that the um, big farms they're retiring, and we are short um, farmers. And people do have that attitude in here in the valley, especially that farming is not a lucrative business. It is. It is. It just depends on how you look at it. Because farming is not corn, grain, and cotton. Farming could be microgreens, where it's high dollar, edible flowers. Like she says, there's a lot of states that um, want quality product and they only grow three months out of the year. Um, you have an opportunity because we're here in the valley and that um, there's a lot of uh, support for agriculture. You just have to find a niche. What kind of agriculture do you want to do? Um, and technology is that they'll find you even if you're a very small farm in um, homes. Just, you know, if you're on the internet, They'll find you and they'll go to you because there's a lot of people that are looking for your product if you decide to do any kind of agriculture. Small scale, yes, um, but the internet and and the need and the demand that's growing is what you have in your favor. I see a challenge as far as um, trying to do it on my own, and I and I did do it on my own for two years, and it's killing me. <laughs> so um, I think co-oping, um, joining other farmers. Um, there is a group here called Stay Farmers, a young uh, South Texas young farmers group. And um, they, they've already started a, a CSA, Consumer Sustained Act, um, with a hospital in McCallum. And so they have uh, started supplying bags of produce. Uh, each farmer grows something and then they take it to the hospital and each individual doctor or employee will uh, grab their bag and it's been contributed by all those different farmers. So doing everything all by yourself, trying to do the CSA, trying to do the farmer's market, trying to do all the restaurants, trying to do, it's, it's gonna, it's too hard to do it on your own. You need other farmers, you need help, you need people of like mind that are just as passionate as you um, in order to be successful at, at several different things. And um, so please just, um, if you have a group of friends, uh, join them, see what they want to do, and start small, and then go from there. I see it as a challenge of the attitude of agriculture, uh, organic agriculture here in the Valley. Since it's not reached here yet, we're still, you know, learning about it. A lot of people don't consider it important, and it is important because it's not about it's they say oh well, organic is expensive. Well, health medicine is expensive. Um, you know, if you you have this opportunity, but we have to change our attitude about thinking that um, food isn't our solution. Food is our solution. When we have high unemployment, high uh, medical issues. We have you know kinds of things that can be addressed by agriculture, but unless we change our attitude um, here, 
both organizations as well as individuals, um, creating more farmers markets without creating more farmers is not gonna work. You know, I see funding all the time. We need skilled people for the organic production, both for the big industry as well as for the little. Those big guys that are getting big, they want to hire that leader that knows um, or has some experience in organic farming. And since organic farming is the highest agriculture that's growing, you have the opportunity to learn something. I mean, we need the organizations to take agriculture, organic agriculture, more serious. Honestly, you go and it's not looked at as something really important, and it is because it's the opportunity for the valley to change. If we have year-round production, we have water, we have a lot of things that can help us. We even have the people who have some knowledge because they come from this background of agriculture. There's a lot of land. I'm from Chicago. We have one house next to the other. You guys have half an acre, an acre. You know, there's so much opportunity but I see it as somebody looking at agriculture is not important. It is, and you have the opportunity to make the valley the food source to all of these other places that need food. She just said it. New York only has two, three months. Even Houston, I think, has, what, four months, five months that they can produce? We can produce a long time. We could be sourcing food from the valley to a lot of places. Instead of Texas being ranked way low, for organic production, we should be first. We should be we should be competing with California. That's what I see. I see an opportunity that we're not taking uh, advantage of. I found my passion with the first presenter, 
and just hung on every word, read a binder for inches thick. It was amazing for me to listen to everything from compost to um, herb gardening. And uh, so there are a couple of different places you can go. UTRGV has the first um, degree in sustainable ag in the nation. And so they do have the opportunities down here to study. Unfortunately, TSTC lost their act program, and that was very disappointing uh, because it was something that was uh, very affordable for our area. So hopefully that will be um, replaced with something, uh, another institute will come on board and support it. <laughs> So my answer is you need to think. That's the skill set. You need to think. Nobody's going to tell you what the answer is. You know, I talked to Oscar earlier. You know, he started out going on the internet, researching things, and reading, and reading, and reading, and reading. Okay, you've read it. Now, how do you apply it? Look, guys, it's a simple, it's a simple formula. You got to be able to be a problem solving, and you got to have applied learning. So. You may not know the answer to something. There's tons of things I don't know. I mean, the first time I started on a farm, how do you how do you how do you make sure you put out enough seed or enough fertilizer? You've got this machine here, and the tires turn, and you've got these gears. How do you know you're putting out enough? I don't know. Oh, let's go look at it. Guess what? Every revolution of the tire. Okay, what's the circumference of the tire? So you measure the circumference of the tire. So you know how often you turn it. Then you 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 catch the seed and you measure how much pounds of seed and you weigh it. All of a sudden you go, oh, okay, so this is, you know, the circumference is three feet. All right, so every time I turn it, I'll turn it 10 times, so I've got 30 feet. I weigh it, okay, now I figure out how, much, how many pounds per acre I'm putting out because I can calculate it. I know how to do that. You know, I want to line it and read something. So if you, I don't care what you do, but at the end of the day, the skill sets the most needed is problem solving and applied learning. You go read it somewhere and you say, hmm, for example, we used to put in another life, we were, we were farming um, uh, parsley and some carrots, right? Well, I said, gosh, the plant leaf looks basically the same. So if I can do this to that at this stage, why can't I do this to the parsley also? Nobody told me I could do it or couldn't do it. What you gotta do is take observation skills and go, hmm, I know this to be true. If this is true here, why can't it be true here? So I would say that's the biggest skill set is problem solving and applied learning. And I don't think you in any industry. Well, back to the same thing for systems, love and, and a lot of labor and, and a willingness to work hard. But you do need math, science, uh, English, because, you know, I hated English. And I wish I, I, wish I didn't because I could market my things better if I if I my grandma was better, right? So you need math, like he said, you need to figure out the numbers. You need you need science because you need to figure out you know what it means and what it doesn't mean. You need English because you gotta be able to sell your product. You know, so you need it all. You you need to go to school and get and and be uh go to school every day because that makes you a um organized person. You know, so everything that you're learning throughout your years, you think you're not going to use them, you are. You are going to use them. You just have to not sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. So you learn what you learned in grammar school, in high school, in college, and take what you, you learned and, and, and add it to what you want to do. Just figure out what you want to do. Think, what is it that you want to do? I would add um, passion for what you're doing, learning how to learn, and patience. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, you don't like what you're doing, every day is going to be torturous for you. Um, learning how to learn. We are in a time of hyper-accelerated learning. School is beneficial because it gives you that initial structure on what to learn, what to look at. but. If there's something that you like, look it up on your own. YouTube and, and all the experts around will teach you. They have years of experience that they can condense down to you know short amount of time. And you can learn anything that you want. 
yes, you need to get degrees to get the high paying jobs, etc. But you can apply those in other ways. You don't have to follow the exact structure. And um, the last part, patience. You're not going to hit it big your first day on the job. Just like the avocado. You know how long it actually takes for that tree to fruit? It's a long time. So get, be patient with yourselves, with what you're doing, with those around you, and it will be fruitful.
don't be afraid to take a chance. You know, um, wherever you go and, and when you go to college, you don't go to college, but look for internships outside of where you live. You know, um, hey, you know what? There's no reason why, if you really want to be involved in agriculture, you can't go get an internship one summer in California or in Indiana or in New York. Like, don't be afraid. Don't keep your, 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 your sights set in this one direction, but you're going to be able to take, be open to, to doing something different that's going to push your boundaries. I think that's the biggest thing we talk about resources. There's a lot of people who will give you a job and give you an opportunity to learn if you ask for it. If you go up there and you're polite and you're professional and say, I want to learn something, they're going to give you the opportunity. I mean, that, that's, people love to hear somebody interested in what they're doing. So, but I would say don't, don't pitch your hole yourself to one area. Use the opportunities that give themselves to go out and try to get an internship somewhere else outside of where you think you're going to be. Because you never know, you might live living there or you might learn something that's extremely important. I would say that, I mean, there's resources everywhere you just got to ask, guys. farm sustainability that's what we're doing we are providing to you the opportunity through us support funding grant money so that we can teach you on how to become an organic farmer currently we've already um, this year done two trainings six weeks long and we have started one that's about 16 weeks long and we've given them uh, 50 by 50 square feet to grow. We've guided them through the whole thing from seed to planting. We're waiting for harvest. We'll show them how to package, how to sell it. Um, and this is all through the USDA funded us to do it. But we can partner with the schools. We can partner with other organizations to provide this training right here local to you. Saul and I have over 12 years of experience in organic farming, small scale. Um, we can teach you the uh, farming part, the trees, uh, the forestry, the microgreens, the um, regular stuff. I mean, that's, that's our goal. Our goal is to provide a center for you uh, if you're interested in it. Now, if you can't come to any of the classes, you can volunteer. You can come and volunteer and learn. I mean, it's all about how much you're interested in doing it. I would say there are lots of opportunities, like Ms. Padilla said, uh, she has many in Mrs. Delgado also, she's laid it out for you, there are lots of things to go after. I would promote the idea that you can make your own opportunity, you can make your own way. Just don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. You have to start small, you can't be the boss on the very first day. You have to be, you have to know what it takes to, for the whole operation to work. And to do that, you need to work. You need to get blisters on your hands. You need, you know, to be involved with that. Um, for example, we I started off at the farmer's market making juice. Well, it turns out I had a contact in San Antonio that worked for, or works for a fresh point. And they are a partner of Cisco the food distributors. They're one of the largest distributors of everything in the world. And now it turns out that there is an opportunity to provide juice to the entire state of Texas. So from the farmer's market, it grew into a statewide thing, which could go national, international, using some of these grants and uh, just being open. I think, uh, yeah, so again, you know, just adding, there's a lot of opportunity out there and it's just about, uh, uh, you know, seeking it. Um, um, I think it's, uh, it, it's, I mean, we, we, live, we live in an age where there's information everywhere. We, like, our sources are so, so broad uh, from, you know, just Googling things, YouTube, uh, you know, I, I read Books, going to the library, just you know, finding all the books that you want on agriculture, just you know, starting to starting to read a little bit about it. Um, I think one one a lot of the sources that, that I've used also is uh, uh, things like as well as social media. You know, you go into a group page of, of agriculture on, on social media, and you have people uh, constantly you know making asking questions of like, hey, why why is this happening to this uh, to this plant or to this crop or or, or to this uh, um, you know product that I'm that I'm trying to produce. 
Um, and you have people willingly, you know, telling you, hey, well, I already have that issue and this is what you can do better. Um, and then it's just, you know, either trial and error, reading, getting all that information. I just saw right now next to me that I, uh, an email, you know, popping up from a USDA, uh, um, just from like signing up to like, you know, get, get news, you know, and, and things like that. You know, you just, the willingness to learn, you know, if, if, if you want to learn, you're going to find the resources and you're going to uh, really do the work so that you can, you can uh, increase your knowledge in, in whatever it is, whatever field you want to get into. So um, pretty much that's it. Is there anything that we're leaving out here or that has not been addressed that you can maybe enlighten us as to what you do so much in in your situation as farmers and agricultural resources? I want to tackle that first. Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. You guys haven't applied for the term much in school, but it's about the money. About, it's, it's the amount of money that comes in and the amount of money that goes out. I don't care what you do, but cash flow is important. Understanding accounting. If you're gonna be a farmer, you're gonna be a baker, you're gonna be whatever you're gonna be, you still have numbers you have to look at every day. You still have to understand what that means for your overall success. So, you know, you may have in your head, I'm gonna go and do X, Y, Z. Make sure you take some classes in accounting because at the end of the day, you're gonna go for a bank loan, you're gonna to have to provide financial reports to the banks. Um, you know, I didn't pay attention to college enough in accounting, and it really hurt me. Uh, luckily, my wife is a CPA, and so she helps me uh, understand what I'm doing. But um, but understand if you start your own business, there are gonna be days that you can't pay your bills. There are gonna be days that you're gonna have to say to somebody, look, I know I owe you this money. I recognize the debt I have to you. I cannot pay you today. And you have to choose who you're going to pay sometimes. I'm gonna pay the trash guy because the trash has been, hasn't been, been picked up for three weeks. It's starting to smell. And I'm gonna pay this person. At the end of the day, you gotta pay your debts and you gotta be an honest individual. But understand that no matter what you do, cash flow is a key to success. And it doesn't matter if you're this big, this big, this big, or this big. It doesn't matter. Every company has the same problems. So don't feel like it's your fault and the weight the world's on you because everyone has it. And you call your vendor up and say, look, I can't pay you. Guess what? They told somebody else they couldn't pay yesterday too. So it's okay to start a business. It's okay to communicate with your vendors or your customers. Tell your customers, look, I'm gonna give you 2% off and of pay me in 10 days. So you lose a little bit of money, but what happens? You are generating the cash flow faster so you can then go pay your vendors and hopefully start to pay yourself. So I would say the biggest thing that, that I didn't do well enough, and that I would encourage you is to make sure you take an accounting cap class, a finance class, and realize that that everyone has the same issue that you have as you start your business. But what's important is you communicate that to your people, and you let them know that you're accountable to your actions. And I think hand in hand uh, with that is your planning. What am I going to put in the ground? So I have a, two farmers markets, I have five restaurants, I have a 50 uh, person CSA. So I have to provide for all of those. So what am I gonna put in the ground? Am I gonna put everything in the ground at one time? And then one takes 90 days, one takes 40 days, one takes 28 days. You have to truly plan so that everything comes out of the ground and harvested when it's wanted. A big complaint about restaurants um, is, hey, um, you're not providing what I need when I need it and as much as I need. So you have to try to be as consistent as possible. You can't just forget hey, Monday, I don't feel like putting any more seedlings in. You can't, because if you're, like I told you, you're, if you're not putting seeds in the ground, you're not making money, and it's not gonna come out in the 40 days that the chef wants it or your CSA. You, it, it's, it's a lot different when you really have a customer and you're accountable to that person for giving them their food. So there's some uh, free uh, spreadsheets out there. You can try like Veggie Compass, 
um, and a few others where you can just um, pop in what you are going to grow and it'll help you figure out um, harvest dates and how much you need for a hundred foot row of seed um, so you don't need the wheel all the time. <laughs> you don't need to ca calculate how big your wheels are. Um, so if you, um, so there's free resources out there that you can start with and then subscriptions that give you more detailed production um, when it comes to that. So at this time, we're gonna go ahead and take a few questions from the audience and our you panelists. So if anyone in the audience has a question that you would like to ask, please do so. Yes. Um, are you planning to have your children or family continue to help and grow your organization? My oldest son um, just told us this year, because he was back and forth with what he wanted to do, um, that we, we, we always tried to get him to go shadow people. We have an architect, that was what he wanted to do. We sent him with an architect. My daughter wanted to be a vet, he, so we sent her to the zoo classes all summer. They changed their minds after they shadowed these people. So my son loves to be outside. Um, he's an Eagle Scout, and so he loves the outdoors. Um, and so he wants to go to a &M to get a horticulture degree and also get his viticulture certification so he can come and run the vineyard when he graduates. So yes. from 
and they, they taste it and they eat it and it tastes good to them. Um, so that was my very first motivation to continue education. After that, when they told me about all the statistics in Brownsville and how we're one of the highest of diabetes and obesity, all the problems that we were having. Also, like I told you, the fast food. Um, the motivation for me when I took over for Brownsville Wellness Coalition was to get people healthy, to open people's eyes, to show them how much sugar is in a Coke, to show them how to grow their own food, how to, uh, how to exercise and get out there. Um, we started a walking group for people who maybe we're too embarrassed to go to a club or get on a bike. Said, so let's walk, let's walk and let's talk and what are your concerns? So um, the motivation was seeing people's lives starting to change, all because they learned how to garden, how to grow their food, they were educated on, on health. And so that was um, my motivation to continue and to try to do it on a much larger scale. I think it was part of basically the same that was mentioned, you know, um, just once once you start finding out how, how you know, how big of an impact it, it can have in, 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 in your life, in your personal life, in your family's life, um, how, you know, it, it, health changes, you know, you're, 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 you start feeling better when you start eating healthier. Um, I mean, we're so used to, you know, just getting something quick to eat, you know, fast food here, fast food there, and, and then, you, then it's everywhere, you know, it's everywhere, so, you know, so it's, uh, and it's so easy, you know, it's, uh, you know, to get it cause, because of the time, you know, like we're always uh, uh, working and, and, and sometimes we don't have time to, to prepare ourselves a meal, um, but, you know, there's different options out there, and, uh, and I think just the fact that, like, knowing that our population is, is uh, um, has a lot of health issues such as diabetes and and, and poverty and uh, so it's just being able to have even if it's a small impact that that impacting someone's life it, it, that person is probably going to change if that their life changes you know they're probably going to speak about it and probably motivate other people to do the same thing so it's a it's a little ripple effect um, and I think you know the, the as little as it is that you do you know it, it, it's going to have some some type of impact. And, several food deserts within each city um, but I think it all goes back to education too so we are one of the highest uh, poverty percentages in the United States but teaching these families how to grow their own food so that their kids don't get go, go hungry or that they can spend that money on other necessities that's extremely important. I mean, you, you, we, we have like opportunity, and we, we can teach all these families um, their own resources because a lot of people don't know their own resources within them. Um, so yes, we we do qualify as for with several food deserts in each city. Actually, the saddest part of, of the RDB is that you have so much land and so much opportunity and some even have a lot of um, they've been migrant workers for, for uh, generations and they don't grow their own food. I find it amazing how I could go through neighborhoods and there's land, there's, they do nothing, nothing. And it doesn't take much for you to grow vegetables. I mean, do a small space. Uh, some moms say that they can't go to work. Well, they, they take their little kids and go to the garden like they did many years ago. They can have food for their for their family and they can sell. I've shown um, someone that in 50 square feet, you can make over $20,000 in 50 square feet. You know, 
it, it's the attitude that, that, that Melissa is talking about. We just need to go out there and say, look, there's water, there's land, and some people have skill. In our, in our, um, in hope, we tell everybody in Yahweh, if you can't afford to buy it, because we focus on our family, if you can't afford to buy it because you say it's too expensive, why can't you afford to grow it? You have time. You have time. We can address the, the health issues by putting in a little effort. We can address the unemployment by creating our own jobs here in the valley. We can, we can answer and solve our own problems here in our community if we kind of think about how to connect the dots. And we shouldn't have that food desert. We shouldn't. We do. I'm from Puerto Rico. Well, I'm from Puerto Rico in December. And everybody knows about the hurricane that happened. And the saddest part was all those people in the city had nothing to eat because all of them were dependent on the local food from the grocery store. How sad. We should not be in that situation ever. If Houston, if we got a flood like Houston did, could we survive? Think, grow something, a tree, a plant, a something, something, and then share with your family, we would not be considered that food desert. Grow the easy stuff so you don't get discouraged. <laughs> Plant trees. Trees are always going to give you fruit. Find out every month of the year that the tree fruits. And you can put avocados, uh, um, mulberries. We grow, we're so tropical. We grow lots of things. If you don't have anything else, you're going to have fruit. And then you start with easy stuff like lettuce, kale, Swiss chard, things that that you're not gonna get discouraged with. Um, but, you know, th those are the things that you should grow in your garden, and we, you have really good climate for for to grow either in the summer or the winter, because in the summer you just need to give it shade. But don't be trying to do the hard stuff, because you're gonna get discouraged and you won't grow anything. And, the, and the, all the lettuce greens you can grow in pots. So if you don't have a backyard, you have pots, you can put pots along the house and grow the greens in, in pots. And, and we're not talking about any other uh, sources. You can do um, aquaponics, hydroponics, microgreens. All of those can be done indoors, so you don't even need a yard.
first make sure you have a water supply. <laughs> Clean water supply. <laughs> Clean or water, just water. Um, the, when we first started um, to farm, uh, we decided to go ahead and put an uh, acre of corn um, and, and we put in the acre of corn um, and the pipe to the property had not been used for three years. Well, the pipe was completely busted and, and broken in. So we got one, maybe half an acre of water in there and then then they had to redo the whole thing and the water came from the other side of the street on the Risaka. And it, so needless to say, the first um, planting <laughs> example did not, it, it didn't go well. So because we didn't test the water supply before we got started. Um, so make sure of that first and foremost. Uh, and then we did call in uh, the National Conservation and Restoration Service, uh, NRCS, with, um, to come and check our property to tell us, they'll tell you exactly what type of soil you have on the property that you're gonna farm, whether it's sandy loam or whether it's clay or anything in between. Now that will definitely tell you if your water's just gonna drain right out and you're gonna have to water more, or if it's just gonna kinda stay there and you might need to add something to loosen up your soil. Um, we use drip. Uh, for us, it's, uh, we pump it out of a pond and, um, and, and then it goes straight into the field so that we don't have to flood. It's, it's more conservation for the environment. The next question. What do you recommend we do to protect our crops during the winter time? Winter's not a big uh, issue for us here in the valley. It's summer. So uh, most of the plants really love the winter here, um, unless it's like breathing for many days, which is very rare. So our, our growing season is the winter. Um, I would say for the summer, you need a nice shade, try to figure out where underneath the trees you're gonna plant. Um, I would not do it for a commercial business in the summer because you're gonna use too much water and the cost that uh, I'll return is not going to be there unless it's for your family or for a few uh, CSA boxes. But um, winter, my experience, the first year we planted, I cried when we got that February uh, ice storm because I thought we lost everything. And as soon as it thawed out, it was happy. The vegetables were happy. I was like, oh my God. So it's happened a few times where we've had the, the one day of uh, cold weather. Remember, I'm from Chicago. You guys don't have winter, you know. Um, and the vegetables uh, did not do do too bad at all. So part of the answer also is seasonality, right? So you're not going to go plant something that's that's not say cold hardy and resistant during for the winter, um, and vice versa. Something that needs cool weather, you're not going to plant during the summer. So you know, people who are starting to experiment with farming something and putting something at home. You need to look at seasonality and what the right time frame is for the crop. Most places we buy the seed, it's going to list what temperature it should use for germination. It's going to list what temperatures it should have um, during the growing process. So if you're planting something that doesn't belong in the winter, you're obviously going to lose it if you if you if it gets if it gets cold. But the other thing to remember, and this is really I don't know the science behind it because well, I do know it, but I'm not like it's not my expertise. But if you have what a lot of big farmers do and small farmers do, it doesn't matter. If you see a cold spell coming through, they irrigate. You know, why do they irrigate? Does anyone have the answer to that? Why do you irrigate when, it, when it's gonna be cold and maybe freezing? Mm -hmm. You know? What happens when water freezes? Does anyone have chemistry yet? Okay, but what, but does it give off? What does it give off when it freezes? Heat, right? There's heat that's given off. So when it's going from water, first of all, the water is below ground, so it's going to be warmer than the temperature, one. And two, as it starts to try to freeze, it gives off heat. That heat then warms the air around it. So, you know, if you have the right crop, great. And if you're worried about cold, you're going to go ahead and you're going to irrigate. You're going to turn the water on. The water is running. Um, and actually, if it does make ice, it'll insulate it somewhat, um, too. But the biggest thing is, is 
that's the science behind it. Is is all you know? A lot of farmers will irrigate when it's going to be cold. So if you were to lose a crop, you need to understand what you're going to lose it to and how you can combat it. Break five minutes and then come back over there. We're transitioning. Just a second. Ready? 
One, two, three. And take another one. One, two, three. Thank you.
starting in about a minute or so. Mr. Bert Gervais, and Mr. Bert Gervais was acknowledged by President Obama for his work as a young leader in America. Bert Gervais, aka The Mentor Guy, is an author, thought leader, and mentor evangelist. Flagentrepreneurs.com describes him, describes him as, a, as a rising star, and the book Millennial Leaders call him one of the top Generation Y leaders in the country. His secret, by the time he was 25 years old, he had already formed 25 mentor relationships. Having been born in Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the world, Burke quickly realized the value of seizing opportunities and encourages his peers to do the same. He came to America with no connections, limited resources, and separated from his mother. Burke quickly turned his step, Burke quickly turned his step backs into step ups. By 2006, while at Bing Hampton University, he started an internet company and was named the East Coast Student Entrepreneur of the Year. By 2007, he had already fundraised $10,000 for Hurricane Katrina victims. His best-selling book, Who's in Your Top High, Your Guide to Finding Your Success, Success Mentors, shares the lessons he learned during his journey. He has spoken to over 30,000 young adults in 30 states and two countries and has been featured on Fox News and USA Today. He wakes up every day with one goal, live up to the epitaph he once wrote for his tombstone. This man's life helped to make average disappear. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm, warm round of applause to Bird Trace. Maybe y'all didn't hear the question. I said, show of hands, who's interested in leveling up? 
Okay, so you know what? Um, third question, how many people won't raise their hand no matter what question I ask? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> A couple honest people in the back. Uh, so my name is Bert. I actually uh, flew in from New York last night to come speak to you guys. And it's so important for me to share what I'm about to share with you today because I'm very excited to share this one idea that I honestly think will change your life. I'm also terrified. <clears throat> Because in order for me to share what excites me about it, I gotta share with you what my biggest failure was. And it happened recently. And it's this really tough thing because sometimes you get on a speaker, you got your suit, you got your unicorn socks. I do have unicorn socks on, just putting that out there. You know, and you're like, oh, I look so cool. But then I gotta actually get into the dirt with you guys and talk about the real. So it's gonna be a little different than most people who come and just tell you how you know easy everything is. I'm gonna be very honest with you, but I promise you, at the end of this, you're gonna understand there's a little thing, there's a little voice inside of you that literally determines every step you take. Whether you advance in your career, whether you talk to some of the panelists that were here today, or you hold yourself back, right? But before I do that, I wanna show you what I mean. So I'm gonna do a social experiment. So I, I have a question. Um, I have something in my pocket, and I wanna know if anybody wants it. All right, so I have a $10 bill here. And I'm just curious if anybody wants it. Does anybody want to come out Okay, all right. So now, I'm like even more curious. Like if anybody really wants it, they can just have it. Like if anybody really wants it. You just, you just have it. You really want it, you just have it. If anybody like really wants it, like it's just, you can literally just have it. If you really want it, you just have it. That's it, you can have it. That's what just, that's what happened. That's the whole thing, guys. That's the whole show. All right, so, Laura, okay, so my only, my only condition is you have to spend it by the end of today, but you have to spend it on someone other than yourself. Can you agree to that? Okay, yes. All right, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Can I have another round here? <laughs> Just playing this out. So, I got a question. I'm gonna throw this out. And I want y'all to be honest with me. How many people, when I said that, in your mind, in your mind, you saw yourself coming up and, and grabbing that 10 bill. Let me get a mm -hmm. <laughs> How many people, let's, get, let's go dark, let's go dark. How many people in your mind saw yourself going up to get that $10 bill, but then you saw somebody else going up to get that 10 bill, and then you're like, oh, that's my money. Pumps in the throat. Did anybody have that thought? <laughs> Don't acknowledge that with the response, right? But let's talk about the first one before it got really dark, right? This idea of like, wait a minute, I saw that, it felt like something I can have, but then something happened, right? Here's what's interesting. And what I'm about to share with you, you can't unhear. I'm gonna share this with you and you're gonna be like, oh, this happens in every area of life. The only difference between Laura, right, and everyone else in that situation, because Laura had it too. Laura had that voice, she's like, can I do, can I, should I not? But she was, she, we have this voice, and I call it the lid. There's this belief that we all have that every time there's something that we want in life, as soon as we get close to it, it's like, you run into like a wall or a lid, right? Think about it this way. Let me get a, mm -hmm, if you know anybody who was like, yo, I really just want to ask that professor for a college recommendation, and they've been talking about it for like a month. Let me get, mm-hmm. Or maybe you know someone, a friend who's like, yeah, you know, it'd be really awesome if I had a summer job, I'm gonna go, there's like a local place, I'm gonna apply, and they talked about it all summer and they never applied. Even though like it was like doable, they kind of knew someone who worked there. Let me get a, mm -hmm, if you know someone like that. <laughs> oh, this is interesting, we just kind of have a lot in common. Well, how about this, how about this? I'm gonna throw another one. How many people know somebody who either wanted to try out for something, like band or sports team, and they're like legit good, like you've seen them, you're like, you got this. And then just like, nah, I really can't try out for drama. Then they're just like, to be or no to be. <laughs> With the system in the mind, except the slings and arrows of outrageous culture. You're like, you're, not, you're doing Hamlet casually? Go apply for drama, what are you doing? <laughs> right? <laughs> Anybody know someone like that? Wait a minute, so what is that? What is that piece? And by the way, I, I, was, I was in the back, but I, was, I had my eye this whole time. Here's what I noticed. I didn't count one student that went up to one of the panelists and asked for information. Did you guys get that? 
Here's the thing. Everyone knows here how to make words with mouth, correct? <laughs> now here's what's fascinating. I was like, I was like thinking about it. Is that how you say it? <laughs> make words with mouth. But here's what happened. There was a little voice that came up in your head that said, "Wait a minute. This person is super awesome. They went to Peru. They were doing this thing. I'm just, a, I'm just a little student for everything else." If you know, I'm not saying it was you, but if you know someone, that's probably what was going on in their mind. Let me get it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So this is what I call remove the, the lid. This is the lid that we all go through, and I promise you, by the end of this presentation, by this conversation that we're going to have, we're going to learn how to overcome it. Because that little voice, once you remove it, is going to be determined whether or not you say, you know what, I see like a uh, career for me, I'm gonna take that step, or I don't, right? So here's the thing, before we do that, I just wanna make sure everybody's in the right state of mind because I believe that even though there's stuff that I wanna share with you guys, if you guys are not like all here with me, uh, it's gonna be hard to do that. So, oh, I'm gonna give you a thousand percent of everything I have, all I ask is for a hundred percent of your time attention. Is that fair, yes or yes? yes. Is that cool, is that, that fair? Yes. All right, thank you, Josiah, you're like a stand-up person, I appreciate you. All right, now, Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I want everyone to do me a favor. I want you to take your hand. I want you to put it on the shoulder of the person next to you in a non-creepy way. I want you to look in their eyes. I want some of y'all just think, am I feeling you wrong? No. I want you to look into their eyes and I want you to say, person, times have changed, seasons have changed, People have changed, but one thing will never change. I will always look better than you. We got a confident crowd here, and I like it. Um, just so I know, in the audience, how many people here are in Miss Monte's class? That's mostly everybody. How many people here are in FFA? How many people here are a senior in high school? How many people here are here physically? <laughs> but you're not here here. Is anybody like that? All right, that's all good. All right, so let's get right into it. Can y'all see the screen? Yes. That's really cool as you can see the screen. All right, so we talked about my background. So this is what keeps us from achieving our dream. I'm gonna give you a, a story that helps understand how you can know what your lid is, like what your individual lid is. I'm gonna tell you what mine is. It's crazy when you hear it. And then I'm gonna show you how to remove it. But first, a little bit more about me. So I believe no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So that's, that's baby me. I was born in Haiti. Um, you know, I wasn't born in this country. I immigrated when I was younger. Uh, if you guys don't know what Haiti is, uh, is there anyone here about that big earthquake several years ago in Haiti? It's the same island as the Dominican Republic, it's off the coast of Florida, very, very small islands, um, so not a lot of resources. Middle me, that's ratchet me, uh, when I was a teenager, I know who I was, I was trying out some things, I thought I was a thug. I grew up in the suburbs, y'all, don't believe that, <laughs> don't believe that, don't believe that. And that's current me with a little Justin Timberlake jacket. <clears throat> So this is super ratchet me. Uh, that's my uh, best friend, Arel, who's my college roommate. So I know a lot of you guys know uh, Arel. Um, so it's pretty, I played uh, college football as a linebacker, so that's why, you know, a lot of meat in my cheeks. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys about my biggest failure. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna explain to you how this idea of a lid works, right? So. I know I got so excited when we were talking about agricultural uh, opportunities earlier because, you know, when I was speaking to Ms. Monte and some of the panelists, it's so cool to know that it's just not just plows and cows. There's all these really interesting, cool areas you can go in when it comes to agriculture. And one of the coolest ones has to do with, you know, entomologists understanding insects, right? And does anyone know what an entomologist is? Nope. Awesome. This kid's gonna do great in college. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm actually obsessed with insects. This is a weird, don't tell nobody, all right? We're live streaming this. Everybody, everybody knows. <laughs> I'm like, nobody knows. Everybody knows. 
So one of my favorite insects is the grasshopper. And this is interesting. Does anyone know how they train grasshoppers? How like zookeepers train grasshoppers? Like if you wanted them as a pet? It's fascinating. To train a grasshopper, you have to take away the number one thing it was put on earth to do, the thing it does best. Jump, hop, it's in the name, right? So here's the thing about, here's what's interesting about grasshoppers. You know how they can jump? They can jump 10 times their height. So I'll give you an example. Who's the tallest person in this room stand up? If they're not standing up, give them elbow love. But I listen, you, you, you six foot five dunker. <laughs> stand up. All right, how tall are you? Okay, so he's six one. So ladies are gonna, are you single? Okay, so ladies, ladies, six one, single man right there. All right, so what's your name? Mike. Mike, six one, single Mike, okay? So if, it's all good, it's all good, Mike, it's working me. So let's say Mike was a grasshopper. He literally <laughs> could jump 60 feet. That's like taking 10, you guys have seen like a basketball hoop, like a proper basketball hoop, 10 feet tall. That's like taking six basketball hoops. He would jump over all six, like, ah, dunk in your face, turn. <laughs> That's what that would be like. That's how high he'd be able to tell if you were. So thank you, give Mike, give six one six Mike. A round of applause. His Snapchat is not kidding. <laughs> so here's what's interesting, right? So grasshopper jumps 10 times its height. So to train it, you have to put it in a box, right? Obviously you put holes in the box, because if you don't put holes in the box, you have to explain to your mom why there's dead grasshoppers in a shoe box, and that would be weird. <laughs> I'm not gonna grow up to be a serial killer. <laughs> All right, so you put it in a shoe box, now here's what's happening. This grasshopper, this mighty, this just awesome specimen of nature, grasshopper, jumps 10 times height. First time you put it in a box, it tries to jump, right? And what do you think happens when it tries to use its leg, flex what it does best, and it tries to jump? What happens when it tries to jump? Someone tells me. It, it hits the lid. But the, the, grasshopper, the grasshopper is like, nah, but you know what? That was a fluke, I'm cool. I'm good, I'm confident, I'm like six one single Mike. I'm like super confident, <laughs> I'm super cool. And so the next week or so, he tries, to, you know, Grasshopper has his little food, does his little stretch, and just, just, you know, just stretch, and it goes, it goes to jump, right? All of a sudden, it's back, Dave, so the Grasshopper regains his confidence, it sets off, it's about to jump, and <laughs> What happens? It's the lid. Nah, man, you ain't gonna do me like that. Right, Angie? You ain't gonna do me like that. I'm a grasshopper. You understand? That's what I do. It's in my name. I'm a... So then the grasshopper is like, you know what? So it's like, it's like a. It's like two months later, Grasshopper goes to jump all of its might, all of its Thor Avengers strength, and then what happens? What happens? I can see. Now the grasshopper's depressed. Grasshopper's depressed. It's eating soft baked chips of white cookies. Red bag for those who are uninitiated. So the grasshopper is starting to lose confidence, right? They're taking away the one thing it was put on earth to do. So then something crazy happens. Three months later, the zookeeper opens the lid of the shoebox. The grasshopper kind of wakes up. You know like when you're having, like you're in a rut and you wake up, you don't want to wake up? You ever have one of those? Like the worst thing I've ever done, like I woke up when I've like been depressed at like 1 p.m. after staying up all night to play video games, eat a slice of cake, goes back to sleep. <laughs> a shame. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> so anyway, Grasshopper does that, wakes up, goes to jump, it's three months later, lid is open, so the Grasshopper, who can jump 10 times its height, no lid, no barrier, goes to jump and <gasps> what happens? Huh? He's free? What do you guys think happens? 
What? He forgot how to jump? He doesn't forget how to jump. He jumped, but how high does he jump? No, like literally, specifically, how high does he jump? Huh? Where the top of the lid was. The grasshopper, even though there's no physical lid, jumps to where he thinks, or she thinks, the limit was. Do you guys get that? The reason I tell you that story is, how many people do you know that you love and you care about? Every time they get close to the thing that they were literally put on earth to do, they hit the lid. And even though it's not a real barrier, it feels real to them. You guys know anyone like that? You're looking at one. So I'm gonna tell you my biggest failure. I had a really, I had a really weird moment a couple years ago. So my background is my parents wanted me to be a lawyer and I, you know, I met with some lawyers. I realized it wasn't for me. I decided to go on my own and I was doing speaking and I was writing books and I was like, oh yeah, I'm living in, like I'm, this is who I wanted to be. And I'm going and I'm speaking to crowds and audiences. I'm like, yo, do be what you can do anything. Do what you want to be. And the whole time I was being a fraud. Because the thing I really wanted most was to do music. And I had killed that dream. Like, it's to the point, it was crazy. Like, when I was young, I wasn't a good student in high school, right? Like, I was getting C's, B's, D's. Just to make a point, I had a music class, I got 100. And like, no, and everyone was like, yo, what's going on with your other grades? Like, no one acknowledged it. And I was like, so, I was like, guys, I'm sending a message, help, right? It's like no one cared, and I got so mad that like no one validated that. And when I was in college, I started doing, I was in a band, I was doing um, Battle of the Band, I was doing MC Battles, you ever see, like the, the MC Battles like on YouTube? I was doing all that. In fact, it's crazy. Um, I'll take you to a particular point. So this is an MC Battle I was in in college. This was several years ago, and there was a crazy thing that happened to me when I really got hit with this reality. It was about three years ago, I was at this show at SOBs. If you guys don't know SOBs, it's a place in New York, it stands for Sounds of Brazil. It's where every up and coming artist performs before they blow up. Drake, anybody here with Drake fans? J. Cole, you guys heard of John Legend? All of them performed there. So I got invited by my friends who we used to do music in high school together. I quit, he didn't. And I was there, and I was there to support him, and I was so happy, I was like, my God, it's whatever. And as soon as he gets on stage, I, this is embarrassing. I'm so embarrassed by this, but I had this huge wave of jealousy and just self-hate. I was like, yo, I could have had this if I didn't quit on myself. I could have had this if I wasn't so concerned with the fact that my parents would be like, yo, what are you doing? You're like a middle class kid from the suburbs. We sent you to be a lawyer, and now you want to like be a SoundCloud rapper? What are you doing? You know? I had this thought, and every time I got close, and let me tell you how close I got. In 2012, I recorded 15 songs for a mixtape. Wrote, recorded. Guess how many I put on SoundCloud or YouTube or anything? Put it with your hand, with your hands. Show me. Zero. Donut. Hollowed out Oreo. Nothing. Right? Because my whole thing, this is my biggest thing. This is me. This is what makes me tick. My whole thing is I'm an expert at getting almost there. I go to the one yard line and I fumble the ball. I get this close and I sabotage myself. Because my lid is, if I'm standing over here, right? My lid is, if I'm standing 20 feet from you, you're going to be impressed by me, right? But if you get to actually see how crummy and how insecure and all the challenges I go through, and if I actually put myself out there for real, you'll be like, yo, you're not enough. And that literally sabotages everything that I try to do. And even though I've had some successes, it's been in the background like a virus. And so my whole thing was, if I can just show people 
how to overcome this, I can add something of value. And just to show you I'm the type of person who's not gonna actually do anything I'm not willing to do, um, depending on how this goes, if we have some extra time, I will actually perform one of my songs for you guys, if that's cool. Yeah. Is that cool? That works? So if we can get through all this, I'm gonna try to go through this as quick as possible. Bars, all right? <laughs> so we're gonna do a quick activity, okay? So here's what's gonna happen. Um, I'm going to play a song. When I play that song, you guys are gonna get up and you guys are gonna walk around, okay? Now, as soon as that song stops, the first person you see is gonna be your partner, and then um, I have some, I'm gonna ask you a question, you're gonna write the answer down on this piece of paper, okay? So I'm gonna play a song. Some of y'all are like, we gotta move, what is this church? You gotta listen to the song first. So this is the only thing I want you to think about. While you're moving around, you and your partner. I want you to think about this. To take advantage of opportunities, you have to remove the lid. Because I didn't tell you how my story ends yet. But the same thing that kept me from having all those songs in a computer and never putting them out, never going to any promoters and saying, can I perform, is the same thing that kept, keeps people from saying, hey, that was really cool. You talked about going to Peru. I'm interested in traveling. Can I set up a, a coffee with you? You know, I'd like to learn more. Or hey, you know, you talked about community gardens. I think that's really dope. Um, can I set up, you know, a 15 minute phone call? Or can we meet at a Starbucks? I'd like to learn more. Or, you know, can you can you give me some some ideas where I can find out some internships, you know, in this career so I can learn more, potentially get paid down the line, right? So the same thing that keeps you guys from taking advantage of those opportunities, the same thing that kept me from saying, oh my gosh, I don't want to be this person who doesn't like. I'm speaking, but I also want to do music. My parents are going to judge me. My friends are going to judge me. Like, how do I make that all work? So I'm like in the mid-season cliffhanger right now, but we're going to actually get to the season finale together. Is that cool? Yeah. You know what I mean? By the end of this, you'll literally be able to go to one of these people like, oh man, you do farming? That's cool. My favorite character, Thanos, was a farmer. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a spoiler. It's in the trailer. <laughs> we're in the end game now. <laughs> all right, cool. So. This is what you're thinking about. So to take advantage of opportunities, you have to remove the lid. So to take advantage of opportunities, you have to what? To take advantage of opportunities, you have to what? Someone told me about the rule of three. To take advantage of opportunities, you have to what? Ms. Monte, this is a really smart group of students. You're doing a nice job. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to play a song, and you're going to walk around. Hey, not yet. You have to wait for the... Keep walking, keep walking. Make some traction. Don't just be next to the person you came here with. I see you. If you are not partnered up, please put a pinky in the air. Okay, I have one pinky back there. Wait, okay. Oh, yeah, we have someone who needs a pinky up, pinky up. All pinkies unite. It's the pinky co-op. Okay, so what you guys are going to do first is you guys are going to introduce each other, but we're going to actually uh, use this opportunity to practice the proper handshake. So you're going to say, can you come here? You're going to say hello. So when you're doing a handshake, by the way, you extend your thumb like this, you connect at the web, okay? You shake twice, and you say, hello, how are you? You introduce yourself, and you let go. I shook a little bit more than twice, and you got, uh, you a little awkward. 
Uh, I'm real awkward. I can't talk and shake twice. I just learned that about myself. Okay, cool. So, you're gonna do that and say, so, everyone first, everyone practice the handshake. Hello. How are you? Cool. By the way, this is a quick power move. This is a quick power move. Um, a lot of body language classes say that in a lot of times in corporate settings, people try to assert dominance by grabbing like the front of your fingers. So try to shake my hands. So if I go like that, and I do like that, it's kind of like a certain power. So don't let that be you. So don't let anyone get you by these. So you just want to make sure, right to the web, two shakes. What happens? Guys, is it okay if you're shaking someone's hands? You know, if, they, if you give them the fish hand, is that good? Okay, firm. So don't do the fish hand, like the, the dead fish. Don't do the dead hand. The, or the madame. Don't do the madame. All right? So, uh, you guys are going to shake hands. You're going to figure out, you're going to say each other's name. You're going to figure out whose birthday is earliest in the year. That's going to be person A. So, I'm going to go, hi, I'm on Bert. Um, I'm on June 12th. You guys Okay, so whose birthday is earliest in the year in this situation? Me, right? All right, cool. So then I would speak first. No, I'm sorry. You would speak first. I would listen first. We're going to value listening today, okay? All right, so you can go to your partner. So take 10 seconds to figure out who's person A. All right, has everybody figured out who person A is? question. We're going to start with the softball, then we're going to pro pro progressively uh, increase, right? So the first question is, what is your favorite comfort food? All right? So this is the food that you got that paper due at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or whatever, and it's 1 a.m. <laughs> you just started. You're looking at the blank screen with the little cursor, it's just kind of like flashing, the little bar flashing. It's reminding you of your past mistakes. <laughs> and you're like, you know what? What piece of food would make me feel like the world was all right right now? For me, like I said, it's soft baked chips of white cookies, red bag, microwave, 10 seconds, mussels melted, dipped in milk, come at me. So go, share, turn. In this in this scenario, you can get this this food. You can get it even if the restaurant is closed. You can still. So if it's a restaurant or if it's a snack. what you want for your future. So, for example, maybe your word is, huh? Yeah, every group gets one paper. Yeah. So, you, while you guys are in your groups, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to share what is one word that describes what you want for your future. So, for example, that word could be, I want freedom, and that because I care about freedom to do the things I want to do, not what people expect me to do, right? Or, 
your word could be opportunity. You know, I feel like I want to prove that I can find opportunities. I don't want to be defined by, you know, what I think are limited opportunities in my area. You know, maybe your word could be leadership, or maybe your word could be travel, or variety, like, oh, I want to travel the world. Like, whatever your word is, um, yeah. No, no, but, yeah, write down your word on, on one side of the paper. Both of you guys write down that word. So you both share your word. What is your one word? Huh? Yeah, each each person have contributes a word to one side of the paper. Yeah, for your future, yeah, what's one word? It could be anything. It could be leader, it could be all-star. Maybe you want to use a phrase, big bang, take low bang, however you want to do it. Okay. All right, we're gonna take 30 more seconds. Just power through it. It should be gut reaction. Don't let that, don't let that lid voice come and try to, oh, I gotta sound cool, or I gotta make this the best word in here. Just whatever word comes to you. All right, do me a favor, if you hear me clap once, if you hear me clap three times, if you hear me sound your left foot three times. Okay, so, just a couple people shout out a couple words. Opportunity, someone else. Honey. Huh? Honey. Honey. Honey industry. No, there's money to be made. There's a rooftop farm in Brooklyn that makes a ton of money selling honey. That traveler. All right, what else? Successful, yeah. Huh? Wild. What else? Huh? Fame. What else? Happiness. Okay. So these are all the things that we want, right? And I don't think these things are unique to this room. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna push you guys a little bit. I want you, with your partner, to write down, and we're gonna post these up. So you're gonna write, write a line under the things that you want. Unless, wait, actually, can I see this? You're gonna, all right. If you wrote on the, on the side that's opposite the sticky side, if you wrote on the side that's the sticky side, you can write this part on the front. If you didn't, you can just write a line under it. Does that understand? So for example, if you feel the stickiness, right, and you wrote on that side the two things that you want, you're, um, you're gonna write a line underneath it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so you're gonna write one word. What, is you th what do you think is the lid that would keep you from achieving that one word, right? And I'll give you some examples. So maybe the lid is, uh, well first of all, I'll give you mine. So mine was, that mine was that if you if you really saw me, you wouldn't think I was enough, right? So that was my thing, like, you wouldn't think I was enough. Particularly, I wouldn't get the, not having the approval of people I care about would crush me. That's this belief that I have, right? So like if my parents or my brother don't approve of what I'm doing, then it would just crush me. So your lid could be, I've done this presentation across the country, I see people say, well, you know what? My family didn't come from enough money for me to chase these dreams. Or, you know, for me to ch achieve my dreams, I have to leave the nest, and that means I can't babysit, I can't do this, and, you know, or maybe, you know, it's because I'm from a small town, I don't have these opportunities, um, you know, or maybe it's, you know, because of who I am, they'll judge me, you know, whatever, whatever way they'll judge me, they'll stereotype me, Whatever it is, I just want you to write down that lid. Take a couple minutes, just write down the word.
All right, guys, so we're going to take 30 more seconds to wrap this, and I promise you, those who did this part very, very seriously, all right, don't write your name on this. I want these to be anonymous. Just, if you wrote it, it's okay. You, don't have to, you can just erase it. It's okay. It's fine. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Has everyone written down what the lid is? Okay. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna have everyone really quickly, this is gonna be anonymous, you're gonna come up and you're gonna put your answers like here. So we're gonna take about 25 seconds. So that's my challenge. Can we do it in 20? Wait, 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 when I say go. Can we, can we, do we have a timer? Hold on, we have a timer. Hold on, put a timer on. Hold on. We got 26 seconds. Please don't get hurt and try to go on the line. We got 15. Is there anyone who hasn't done it? So nobody's trolling. We've all done it. Okay. We pause. All right. So we did it in about 25. Give yourself a round of applause. All right, so let's see what some of these lids were. Okay, so here's what I want. Just, uh, if I read a lid and it's familiar to you, just go, mm-hmm, all right, cool. So this person, their positive was they want to experience life in a different perspective, but the lid was getting out of our comfort zone. Someone put self doubt. Somebody put haters. Somebody put judgment of my loved ones. Somebody said not trusting in God. No, guys, no. This is we're not. You'd be surprised how many people have the same note in the comments. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna honor everybody and we're not gonna judge. This is gonna be a safe space. Somebody put thinking I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Somebody put my mother or father is the lid. <laughs> that one had a big reaction. Somebody put doubt in comfort zone. Somebody put I come from a small town, not enough money. <laughs> Not being able to be enough. Hmm. Do you guys get that for almost each one of them, a pretty decent percentage of the, of the room was dealing with the same lid? Do you guys get that? Yes. Do you guys see, like, and this is just in this room, but do you guys see how that can keep you 
from, what did you guys say, opportunities, travel, growth, wow, enjoyment. Like, do you guys see how that can get in the way? Do you guys see something as simple as like, man, I'm at this career fair, all these people who gave up their time, these people talk about cash flow, like it literally costs money for them to be here, they came here to park, but it's like, oh my gosh, maybe I'm not, do you guys see it? like, if, if I'm someone who doesn't think I'm enough, there's no way I'm ever gonna ask that person for a coffee or for an email or to stay in touch, you guys see that? Even if I'm capable, even if I'm smart, even if I'm getting good grades, even if I'm hustling, you guys see how that's gonna get in the way, right? So I want to go a little deeper about what I have to do to overcome mine. So, and hopefully this can help you guys. <laughs> so this is what helped me overcome mine. I'm gonna, the most important thing why I had you guys write down your lid, I want you to share your lid with at least one person. Here's why. When you have at least one, because when it's in our heads, everything seems so normal, right? Like, oh my gosh, like this is what, what it is. I call it a socially acceptable excuse. We all make them, right? It seems super, super normal to beat ourselves up, to feel we're not enough. But then sometimes, you ever have that friend that's like, what are you talking about, bro? You're awesome, or like, you're super dope. Like, why do you feel that way? And you're like, oh, you're right, I didn't see it that way. You ever, you ever been in a situation like that, where you see two friends and one can see the positives, but the other one's just 100% focused on the negatives? You ever see that? Right, so that's why it's important to share the lid. So I was actually, I was in Texas actually with my friend EJ, and we had just left the speech and we went to Steak and Shake. If you've never been to Steak and Shake, they're a place that serves steaks and shakes. <laughs> and I'm gonna break it down for y'all today. You know. So we're leaving Steak and Shake and we're in the car and a song plays. And you know how sometimes they play a song and they play the instrumental like the last 30 seconds? You ever heard like, it's your, you ever heard, like your song come on and you make the ugly face, you're like, mm, yeah, mm. You ever, you ever had your song come on and it like hits you on a visceral level you ever had that? Right? So I was making the ugly face, so, mm, oh, woo, right? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, your ugly face is ugly. <laughs> so, during that 30 seconds, I just started freestyling like off the top. And my friend EJ's like, yo, this is dope, like, keep it going. I was like, this is dope. And I just started killing it. He's like, yo, that was really, really good, man. I'm like, thanks, man. He's like, yo, how come you don't do any, like, uh, rap or performance at your speeches? I was like, well, I don't know, it's weird because I'm a motivational speaker. They're going to, maybe they think it's weird, maybe they're gonna think it's too ratchet, maybe they think I'm weird. It's like, who's this dude in a suit? And then, like, my parents, and this, that, and third. And he was like, yo, you realize, you went on stage today and you told everyone to get out of your comfort zone. And you're being a fraud right now. And he's like, yo, you're an amazing rapper. You gotta share it with the world. Like that thing that you have, you gotta share it with the world. So maybe you're a student and the thing that you can share is your curiosity and wanting to learn about someone in, someone's industry. And you're like, I can't because they'll think I'm stupid because I might ask the wrong question, right? And I wanna empower you to know like, when I was in college, if you say, yo, I'm a student, Here's my student ID. I want to learn a little bit more. And I actually have a sample email that we used to use to meet with CEOs for lunch in college all the time. But that's just the technical. I want to give you the emotional part. I'll share that with you at the end. But if you guys, do you guys get that though? Do you guys get like, my friend is literally hearing me. He's like, yo, trust me, if you were whack, I would tell you. Right? Some of y'all might think I'm whack. I'm not from a little bit. But I couldn't get past that. So what I had to do was I had to literally tell my best friend. Or I say, listen, man, if I do nothing else, I have to put it in the state box. I have to perform at SOB. That's why my friend performs is so important to me. So you know what my friend does? Haley, can I tell you this? He goes on Facebook, right? Because what's my biggest thing? I don't want you to what? I don't want you to what? See. I don't want you to see me. I don't want you to really see me because then you'll be able to judge me. Goes on Facebook and says, guys, anyone knows Bert for the last 10 years, what he's wanted to do more than anything is music. Um, if you think Bert should drop a mixtape, <laughs> Comment. If we get 100 comments, he has to do it. <laughs> and he tags me, and I wake up, and I'm like, oh! <laughs> That's really how I felt. So then I was like, oh my god, all these people know now I'm going to die. Like, thorns are going to come, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh. So 100 people commented, of course. My friend, who's a DJ in Houston, was like, yo, let me know, send me a song, I'll play it in the club. Another friend who was like at MIT, was like, yo, 
people at MIT like rap music, so we'll have you come perform at MIT. I'm like, what? Performing for scientists? <laughs> And by the way, I'm gonna I'm pull it all together because I'm actually very interested in STEM. Like we were talking, I was talking with Mr. Castillo about robotic bees because I run a technology center for teens. Like I'm actually fascinated. So I'm like, how do I combine technology and hip hop? So then, because I put that pressure on myself and I had that friend holding me accountable to remove my lid, it opened new possibilities. And I want to share some new, some new possibilities, and then I'm gonna show you. So the first new possibility. Oh, by the way, this is my motivation. Um, in addition to my friend, this is uh, my niece. She was born 11 months ago. And when I held her for the first time, I was like, I, I would love nothing more than for my niece to be proud of her uncle. And I can't do that by pretending to be who everyone else wants me to be. So, so what did I learn? Uh, what did I learn when I removed my lid? I actually did this, uh, it's not true of me, it's not like when I did this in Photoshop, but uh, <laughs> what did I learn? So the first thing was, when you remove the lid, you take advantage of opportunities. I shared with at least one person, I found a mentor, and go. Well, so the first thing was, I spoke at Google, right? So I wanted to do more STEM, stuff with STEM, and I partnered with one of my friends who was kind of like a mentor, and he had a youth STEM event at Google, and he was like, yo, you're a great speaker, you should do it. So he invited me to speak at Google, and I'm still trying to figure out, well, how do I connect that with STEM? So I started doing that, speaking at Google, again with STEM, and then I had to start working on the mixtape because my friend called me out on Facebook, right? So what I've been creating these last four or five months is I've, is I've created a program called Hip Hop STEM. It's gonna be the first world's first summer camp that teaches STEM curriculum using hip hop, right? So I'm gonna combine hip hop, trap music, and science. science. Right? <laughs> Trust me, it all connects. So, This is why I'm so passionate about you guys believing in yourself and what's possible. For the last three years, I was going in the streets of New York, there's a place called Union Square, and I was going to freestyle battles and freestyle competitions, just rapping. Crowds of 30, 40 people, no money, just rapping. And I would show up every Friday from June to November rapping. I didn't go out, I didn't go on dates, I didn't do anything, I went on Fridays, right? One of those Fridays, like six months ago, this dude named Gregory Wilson, he's, uh, he's at NYU, he's also an artist as well, he said, yo, I really like your style, I really like that uh, punchline you did, stay in touch with him. Got his Instagram, we've been going back and forth to Instagram. What was the place I told you guys I wanted to perform? SOBs. SOBs. So he texted me in January, he's like, yo man, I have an opportunity, there's a thing called a day summit, it's at SOBs. Send me your songs, do you want to perform? So, initially, by the way, I was terrified. Can you guess what my reaction was when he emailed me? <laughs> right, that was my initial reaction. But then I told my friend, he's like, yo, you gotta follow up. So I followed up, I sent them my music, and I got selected to perform. And I wanna let you guys know that Sunday night at 10 p.m., I performed at the day summit at SOBs. When three years ago I was on there, I thought I gave up my dream. I thought I could never do this thing. Sunday night, this past Sunday, I got to go on the same stage that Drake, John Legend, J. Cole, all of my heroes performed, and I got to perform my songs. So I just want to let you guys know that if you want to take the opportunities in front of you, whether it's in the agriculture industry, whether it's, you know, I wanna be a food scientist, entomologist, you know, whatever you wanna do. I wanna make money selling honey. I wanna build, I wanna build the next robotic bee. They're, they're really creating robotic bees to pollinate because you know we're losing bees, right? So whatever it is, if you wanna take the advantage of opportunities, you have to do what? You have to do what? You have to remove the what? Remove the lid. So now, enough talk, bars. Let's get to these songs. Everyone grab a seat. I'll perform some of the songs. This is my SoundCloud if anyone's interested. My rap name is Clark Wayne, like Clark Kent Bruce Wayne. And then, uh, let's get to these songs.
Hold on. Please have a round of applause to 
everyone who helped put this organization, the, this event together, um, you know, Mr. Castillo, uh, Luciana, just everybody, Ms. Monte, Jonathan, Lemme back there, everybody, I missed out everybody, uh, everyone who helped with the sound, just everyone, you know, it, it, it really takes a lot of time to put something like this together because they believe in you and they believe that you can be more than what your lid is and the possibilities for you. Raise your hand if you were reminded of something you need to be reminded of today. Okay, raise your hand if you learned something new that was that you needed to hear today. Awesome, so this is because of all the people back here. I'm just a small instrument. Thank you so much. We're just very grateful we got to be here. And I just wanna let you guys, for the first time in my life, I can say I'm actually authentically living my dream. And it's so just incredible to be able to share that with you guys. And I hope you guys get to do the same all you gotta do is remove your lid. Peace. Do we have any questions? Anybody have any questions? This is, uh, by the way, um, this is uh, the sample email, follow up email, by the way. Uh, this is a, so I wrote a book on how to f find mentors. Um, if anyone wants, I'll send you the PDF for free, but I honestly, it's such an important skill. So this is, a sample email, I would say. It's like, hey, it was great talking to you. Um, you know, say their name. I appreciated what you said about, insert one thing they said. So for example, this person talked about going to Peru. Someone else talked about co-ops and community gardens, right? So you insert one thing they talked about, then you say, I'd like permission to get in touch with you for a 15 minute call if you have a specific question about what we talked about today. Here's why you say that. This is a little, little hack. Most people will take your call, especially if you're a student. This is why it's important to remove your lid, right? Like, why would they talk to me? What's everyone's favorite subject? Huh? Themselves. Themselves, absolutely. So you being a student, there you go. Show some love. So you, so you being a student saying, hey, I'm giving you the gift of curiosity, most people will take that call. Someone emails me and they want to talk, and I know, and, but you have to give a time limit, because some people are like, oh, is this person gonna talk my ear off for like an hour, and not have any smart questions? But that's why if you use this format, you take one thing they said, or one thing that's you know related to what you wanna talk about, and you say a 15 minute call, and I promise you, if they really like you, it's never a 15. Like if you need more, they'll always give. Like if someone hits me up, like I'm, I'm, I'm traveling, I'm doing this, and you're like, yo, I need a 15 minute call, and you're specific, you're like, hey, how do you, you know, how do you get your song in SoundCloud, or how do you become a speaker, or how do you, you know, how are you combining, you know, science and hip hop? I will take that call. I will definitely schedule a 15 minute call. Now, if you hit me up like, yo, I just wanna talk your ear off for a whole weekend, I'm like, well, I don't know, I gotta wash my knees, I gotta do this, I don't know, but if you're specific, this is how you get around that. Does everyone get that? Please take a picture of that. This should be something you take, you go home, you use, like, this is that, the handshake, the eye contact. Definitely these are things that you should be able to use, like, right away. Is that helpful, is that helpful to you guys? Yeah, okay, awesome, cool. So does anyone have any questions before I leave? Just, you know, to take a few minutes for Q&A. You guys are good on? Who are some of my mentors? Yes, yeah, so one of my mentors actually was the, we had an entrepreneurship professor at our school and I actually found, found him this, the same exact way. We were going around, we were interviewing a bunch of local business owners, pizza owners. This is when I figured out I didn't want to be a lawyer. And they were like, you gotta talk to this guy, Ann. She teaches at the Binghamton Entrepreneurship. I was a history major at that point. Um, now, this guy's an incredible person. He, too, was in a great student in high school, uh, Italian immigrant, didn't come from money, one of like eight kids, ended up being like the wealthiest person in Binghamton, <laughs> you know, has a special needs daughter, loves her with all his heart, he's a great family man, he gives to the university. He's like building a pipeline. Like, he's just an incredible person, right? So he took me under his wing, and he made me feel like a star, even when I didn't believe in myself. He put me in a business class, even though I wasn't a history major. We ended up winning the business plan competition. That's how I started my first business. I mean, he just was one of the people that changed my life. Um, another guy's name is Michael Simmons. I was telling someone earlier, my goal up until 20 was like, I wanted to go to California. So I know some of y'all were like, oh, it'd be so cool to go to New York. New Yorkers think the same thing about the West Coast. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> like, I was like, yo, if I could just go to California, you know what I'm saying? Like, because when I was 18, I had never been to Texas, I had never been to California, I had never been to the West. So, this guy named Michael, who was friends with my college roommate, when I was in college, I was about to graduate, a relative, my friend goes, my roommate, he goes, yo, this dude is like our age and he wrote a book, you gotta read it. I was like, yo man, I don't wanna read a book. I got finals, I'm already reading books for school, I'm not gonna read a book for leisure. He's like, no, no, trust me, you gotta read it. So I literally read it in two days. We went to Starbucks, met him in the city. 
four or five years later, I get an email from him saying, listen, we have this tour in California. We had someone who's supposed to be the assistant manager who just dropped out. Can you come and stay in California for a month? So I literally got to be like a hobo in California for a month in like every city in California. I didn't get to stay long, but I was like literally like waking up on the beach with five bucks in my pocket, the happiest person in the world. So yeah, mentors definitely made a, made a huge difference. And I have a bunch of them um, today. I'm part of this thing called the Young Entrepreneur Council, um, which is like top entrepreneurs uh, under 30 in the country. And just a lot of them groom me, shape me, give me ideas. Anything else? Yeah. So I ended up going into political science. Um, so initially I was going to law school, but I, so I was doing philosophy and law, so I ended up doing like history and political science. Yeah. Uh, the way I got into rapping was, so like I mentioned, I was an immigrant from Haiti. I had like a very thick accent, I didn't fit in. And I still always remember this. I think I was like 12 or 13 and I got invited to this party and I went to a high school where it wasn't very diverse. I was one of the few uh, black people there. But as soon as I got there, they were playing hip hop and then they had this open mic and I just got on stage and I freestyled. And everyone was like, oh, that was pretty cool. It probably was bad, but like for, for them, just like a 13 year old going up, like it was legible. They were like, that's awesome. And I was like, wow, this is positive attention. Like I normally don't get positive attention and I made people happy. I want to keep doing this and that's how, how it happened. Where did you go to college? I went to, I went to college two places. So my freshman year I went to Syracuse. I played football there. Um, where's Jack Reiner? So I played football at Syracuse. I, I made a lot of dumb decisions and I ended up getting kicked off the team. So learn from my mistakes. Um, so I had to transfer to Binghamton. But yeah, well, I was a walk-on. So a bunch of division one studs who go to the NFL and I was able to walk on the team. And then I messed it all up. <laughs> yeah, good times, yeah. Fear you're not good enough, right? Kiara said her lid is feeling like she's not good enough. She wants to say, but she's seen social media, all these people. How do I overcome that? Here's the first thing. Realize that that voice doesn't come from you. I guarantee you if you close your eyes right now, right? And every time you want to actually sing or do something, if you write down what the actual words you hear, think about that. Oh, you're stupid. You can't do it. They're better than you. Now, I want you to think about whose tone of voice is that? Who in your life? It's usually like a parent, a sibling, someone close to you. Like for example, I'll give you mine. So mine is, uh, when my parents got divorced, uh, my dad like left, and so my brother was very much like the person who kind of like the dad in our house. And my brother's very res responsible. He's like great savings, great that. I'm very irresponsible. I'm just very talented and just very passionate. But he's, my brother's not as talented, but super responsible. So every time I do something, like I hear a voice saying, yo, you're really gonna spend $3,000 on a mixtape? You gotta pay off this and do that and do that and do that. And I'm like, I don't talk like that. I'm like, whose voice is that? And one day I had to really listen. I'm like, yo, that's either my dad's voice or my brother's voice. And I'm like, all of my limitations, it's not even my voice. Because you guys realize this, when you're a baby, you're not born with voices inside your head. It's other people's voices that you hear that you start to adopt as your own. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I stopped looking at social media like other singers. And just the comparison thing, I'll tell you right now, like um, the comparison thing, like even when I go, like I saw my friend, I'm like, oh my God, he's so much better than me. I have to, decide to, I have to literally lock myself in a room just to do my music and do me. And also remember when I listen to, let's say I listen to a new J. Cole song, I'm like, he's been doing it for like 15 years. Like this is his like 10th album. I can't compare his fifth song on his 10th album to my 12th song ever. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like a lot of these people have been putting in the work, so you're giving yourself an unfair comparison. And two, remember why you're singing. Do you remember why you're singing? Why are you singing? Because I love to do That's a beautiful reason to sing. But whose voice was it? Have you identified it? Huh? What? Okay, exactly. 
So there's this like, I'm not enough, and maybe I'm gonna prove that I never was enough to you, right? So this is like a very fearful thing. You, get, you see what I'm saying? Is anyone else relating to this? Because don't think I'm just talking to Kiara, because who am I really speaking to? Right? When I said the parent thing, Matthew's like, mm-hmm. It's the thing, guys. It like I've done a lot of like going growing pains when it comes to the parent thing. And yeah, so I hear it all the time. And here's what I'll tell you. What parents actually want, because they're doing the best of what they have is a happy child. Like my mom is not happy with a miserable son who's not choosing music. She thinks she is, just like, well, maybe he's doing the safer job. She's because when I do music and when I like there's certain things that I started doing, doing music, I went to therapy, I did that. And the way I treat my mom and I'm happy, it just makes her so happy. Like when I'm like, hey mom, I brought your favorite movie, I made food for you, this, that, and the third, and she's just happy, she sees me happy, that's what she actually cares about. You know what I mean? They're doing the best, because they don't understand music, no parent does, right? But you succeeding at it, they're gonna be your number one band writing fan, I promise you. Like when I wrote my first book, my parents were like, this is stupid, you should've been a lawyer. Then my book became a bestseller on Amazon, my mom made all her friends buy it. She's like, my baby wrote a book, blah, 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 blah. and I was like, where was this before? It's because they're nervous, they don't know how to handle it. You know what I'm saying? And you literally, you take my email, like hit me up, anything I can do to support you, and get around some supportive like friends. Like I, you know, I, I'm at a Boys and Girls Club, we have a studio, and I'm, I run the studio, and I'm like, yo, there is no judgment in the studio. If someone comes in, they're still learning how to sing, they're doing that, we will do zero judgment, it's all support. So you have to find a way to make a music in a place where they support you. And maybe that means not sharing with certain people at first. You know, I didn't share with everybody at first because I just needed to get over the hump. Because artists, we mad sensitive, but I'm just keep it real. I'm in a songwriting class and everyone introduces their song like, well, I didn't really get to, t well, this song is this not proper structure. And I'm like, yo, just play the song. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's in a song, and it's in New York City. It's like everyone's trying to be an artist there. So it's literally everybody. So I just want you to know you're not alone, but it's, Use that you identify that that's not your voice. Do you get that? And what would be, I want to take you through this. What would be possible for you if you were not a slave to that voice? I want you to imagine the future, like, and that voice is not there. What would be possible for you? Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. Okay. But emotionally, what would be possible for you? Not hiding who you really are. You guys get that? Does anyone ever feel like, let me get, mm -hmm, if you feel like you gotta hide who you really are just to make it, right? I just want you to know that you, by sharing this right now, Kara, you just helped a whole bunch of people maybe who didn't have the courage to share. Can we give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> you are enough, all right? Awesome. Anyone else have a question? Yes. What advice would you have for our teachers here at the high school or around the world? Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for everything you're doing because it's not an easy job. Uh, I just want you guys to know that teachers are humans. Sometimes you're like, this is the person who graded my paper and I don't grade that grade. But a lot of times, like they leave work, they think about you. Like when you do bad, like teachers take it, for, like they generally want you to do well, like it impacts them. And I know just because having worked at a boys and girls club, worked with teachers, managed teachers, and been a teacher, first of all, the first step is thank you for what you're doing. This is like, it's really is a value and a gift. And a lot of times it's a job that is kind of thankless because people don't recognize everything you do behind the scenes. So that's one. The second thing is, this is me, my biggest fear when I became a teacher, is set goals and share it with the students. I had to share with, share with my students that I was trying, to, that I was not trying, that I was making a mixtape and that I initially failed. I had to do it. Because when I ask them and I push them, hey, why don't you do this? I know you're good at this. They look at me like, what are you doing? Like it's the dirty secret. Like my biggest fear is like, they'll look at me someone who teaches because I can't do. And my, t my students look at me way different. Even though I'm not like at Madison Square Garden yet, but the fact that I'm out there, the fact that I'm putting myself out there, I'm starting to do songs. Like I'll be like, hey guys, I made a new song. Here's the clean version. Because <laughs> you're students. <laughs> Don't be like, this is the part, that's what's up. You know what I mean? Like, so set goals. You know, when we did a parent training, one of the things that we talked about is like, if you have a goal and you share with the student, like, hey, I'm gonna try Zumba or I'm gonna try this, it's it's such a bonding experience for students to know, like, wow, the learning never stops. So once the, the students can see with the, with the teachers that they don't stop learning, 
it inspires them even more to learn. I know you have great role models. Ms. Monte, I was just speaking to you, and already, like, I want to give you a hug because everything that you're doing, um, and your story, too, is, like, just awesome. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. Any last questions for her? Haley, you, you can ask that question. I saw you. Um, when you fail to make your mistake, um, during that, I'm pretty sure you were sad or hurt about it. How did you get through it? How did I get through it? Well, first of all, um, I want to thank you for making it here today. I know it took something for you to be here today. Um, and I want to give you permission to be kind to yourself and not um, beat yourself up. I noticed that you changed your lid and you like crossed it out. As if to say, even my lid isn't good enough. <laughs> and it's like, you are good enough. You know? So I want to give you permission to be kind and also recognize the wonderful things that you do bring to the table. Uh -huh. Just you being here, your energy, uh, your positivity when you were in the group, I saw you participating, that actually means a lot. I want you to know that, okay? Um, so how did I get through it, just like failing? Uh, this, this is, I'm gonna keep it 100%, numbing myself. So there's only two, way we, we, two ways we live life. We do what we're meant to do, or we numb ourselves to the reality that we're not doing that thing. It's literally one of the options. So if you notice, like for me, emotional eating, I was an insomniac, I was going through all these things, I was doing other projects that I thought would make me happy. Literally everything was a replacement and a distraction. So the way that I coped was replacement, distracted, really unhealthy eating, unhealthy spending, everything to sabotage myself. Because I'm like, even like, I'm not gonna be good at budgeting because I'm good at budgeting, I'll have enough budget to like really manage to mix it. So I'm bad at that. I'm gonna overeat, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Like, just everything that I could do to not face that reality, I'm gonna binge on uh, Netflix shows, right? You know, I, you, you ever sit down and watch four seasons of Arrow in one sitting? It's not healthy. <laughs> Some of y'all like, Game of Thrones, though, no. <laughs> right? So that's how I did it. But the most important thing, I had to take baby steps. Instead of looking at it like, yo, I have to get to Madison Square Garden, I'm like, yo, let me just perform in Union Square. Let me just, I signed up for a songwriting class. You know, it was a couple bucks. I signed up for a songwriting class. I went to see other artists perform. I just needed to have that visual. I said, what are the smallest steps because I couldn't see myself up here, I at least had to go from depressed to okay. A lot of times I think speakers myself because they'd be like, yo, you can be anything, and you're like going through a depression, they're like, you can go from depressed to amazing, and sometimes you just gotta go from depressed to okay. Because if you can get from depressed to okay, then you can get from okay to good. If you can get to good, then you can get to, right? So it's like whatever that journey is for you, it's okay and that's perfectly acceptable. For me, my race, I literally had to go from depressed to okay, to like, oh snap, they like this song. You know, like I had to have those little mini victories and celebrate, I have a gratitude journal. I have a friend in Chicago, every night I text her three things I'm grateful for. Little things like that I had to do, right? I surrounded myself around musicians because if you really wanna do something, you gotta immerse yourself. That's why I was so big on like, yeah, please, if someone's in agriculture and you're interested, don't let that lid of who I am or small town, whatever, like ask them, like surround yourself, make these people your friends, they will pay off later. Does that make sense? I just wanna make sure I bring it back to the focus of the, sound good? Cool. Um, I hope I'm not, I don't know if I went over, I'm just, I just wanna make sure I was providing value. Um, I just wanna say I'm very thankful for you guys. You guys are just an incredible uh, audience, it's just an incredible group of humans. And uh, I wish nothing but the best for you. This was. So nerve wracking for me to just get so deep and vulnerable, but I really appreciate who you guys are and who you're becoming. All right?